fundraising today is an extremely crucial part for any social development organization but it is also one of the most uh, ignored aspect in in the day to day work of organizations except for a few large organizations most organizations working at the grassroots level do not have their fundraising strategy in place or a lot of fundraising that happens it happens on an ad hoc basis or the responsibility of fundraising always falls on the shoulder of the founder or the co-founder uh, but today i think it is very important for organizations to have uh, a fundraising strategy in place and at the same time also look at what are the other innovative ways that other organizations have explored and what are the ways in which an organization can best leverage their strength when it comes to fundraising there are many organizations today that have uh, successfully run like innovative fundraising campaigns in india and outside today we'll be looking at one such case study where a bunch of journalists put together a fundraiser uh, campaign to support women journalists from afghanistan to leave uh, the country after taliban took over last year there are a lot of uh, things that we can draw from this case studies and i hope you find this useful so today we are speaking to alifia about uh, one of the fundraisers that she had uh, run for uh, journalists for women journalists from afghanistan so thank you alifia for being on this podcast it's really a pleasure to have you here uh, we know each other for the last i guess what like 15 years and you have been a journalist for for over i think 18 20 years now uh, right from your journey which started from i think uh, business india uh, then with the times of india and Forbes and Open Magazine and a bunch of other sort of publications. You have worn various hats, whether it is a reporter, copy editor, assistant editor for photos. You have also curated photo exhibitions and uh, most notably one on the Mumbai 2611 terror attack. You have also made a documentary film and most recently have worked with a social enterprise. So today I want to talk to you about uh, like one of the projects that you did. uh with uh, basically a fundraiser that you did like for 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 women journalists in afghanistan and when kabul fell like very recently to, to the taliban uh that was a time when you did a fundraiser to get journalists women journalists out of afghanistan and get them to a safer place uh, so could you could you talk to us about like the campaign what was the campaign about how did it go and how did that idea sort of came about thanks amit for having me here today just to give you a brief background on the whole thing um afghanistan has always had a very special uh, connection with me and my husband so my husband is a photojournalist with uh, ap the associated press which is a wire service a us wire service so rafiq has been going off to afghanistan over the last decade more than a decade he's been there every year every two years so I have been watching the country and its geopolitics learning about its culture its history all of it through his eyes and you know of course also learning a lot about his friends and colleagues there that he's gotten really close to over the last few years recently in July 2021 when Taliban was slowly making its way into the country and capturing one region after the other uh writers uh, one of writers photographers from india danish siddiqui had gone there to kabul to cover uh, what was going on and uh, unfortunately he was he was you know he lost his life there in in a taliban attack and uh, that was a huge huge loss i don't think rafiq's ever going to you know or or for that matter I, even when i think about it it it's just shocking it's shocking how this could have happened and so yeah we were then chatting with you know in the aftermath of all of that we were chatting with one of ap's um, photo editors who had uh, called dr rafiq about something and we were just on the phone and we were chatting and uh, obviously talking about what was going on in afghanistan and um, she mentioned how um she was a very active member of nwmi which is the network of women in media in india and uh, you know she was telling us about how 
they were racking their brains on to what can they do to help and um, somehow the idea of a photo online print sale came about and uh, she mentioned that uh, she was you know waiting for a green signal from AP but most probably yes they would be very happy to have some of their prints some of their photos from their archives over the last 20 years basically for us to use that as a fundraiser for this cause uh, so this campaign basically was possible because of two key uh, collaborations. One was uh, AP coming forward generously and agreeing to open its archive to us selecting prints and putting them up for sale. That was a very, very key collaboration. The other one was a collaboration with uh, NWMI, the Network of Women in Media India. And they wanted to help women journalists in Afghanistan. So this is how the whole idea for the fundraiser came about. And we decided to go ahead with, uh, you know, NWMI also had a collaboration with an organization in Australia called the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance. And Media, Entertainment, MEAA, helped us with the back-end logistics of you know letting us use their payment gateway to help us disperse funds to help us route the funds to women who needed help and that's how this whole thing has worked out because a lot of people selflessly gave of their resources their time expertise and whatever else they could manage with with the taliban coming back into power in afghanistan it was obvious that the first casualty there would be women and especially women in media because uh, you know overnight they became voiceless faceless and lost everything that they had worked so hard to get over the last two decades so yeah we started this fundraiser in early september by the time we finished the fundraiser, we had managed to raise over a hundred thousand dollars. We never ever thought it would happen so quickly, so organically, and so easily out of literally nothing. Uh, there was a case of this one 25 year old reporter who was a reporter and presenter with an Afghan radio station. And when Kabul fell, she left with uh, three members of her family and i think she went to turkey and there were still other like her parents were left behind and you know other close family members were left behind but we just realized that and this was the same thing that we saw over and over where we realized that while we can help just that one individual it didn't seem right to ask that individual who most probably was a mother or a daughter or a sister to leave her kids or her parents or her siblings behind and just make her own way to safety and not take, you know, her, it, it's put their, put yourself in their shoes. Okay. So while we thought that the money would go a long way towards helping a lot more women, we realized that we had to account for one plus maybe two or three. Okay. It, you know, it wasn't possible for us to just take that one person. I feel this is the least you can do to make sure that the the dreams and the hopes and the hard work of women over there continue to be respected, to be heard, to be given all kinds of assistance to just make sure that this doesn't, they're not wiped out. And so, yes, we've managed to help a little over 30 women get a fresh start in life. And we hope they in turn will will find another voice and will help uh, the others who are still in Kabul in Afghanistan see better days. Some of these photographs that you that you put out was really impactful, right? And these are some of the best pictures that have been taken over over a period of twenty years by various by various uh, journalists and, and photographers. So could you could you talk a bit about uh, like what these I mean photographs were, what did they actually mean, and why they got such a good response from from across the world? So um, these photographs have all been taken by AP's team of photojournalists who have been in 
Afghanistan over the last two decades or more. And we were very clear that we wanted to showcase just daily lives of people, you know, a country that once was. So whether it's roadside vendors or whether it is, um, you know, a UN um, refugee camp or whether it is, um, you know, helicopters flying overhead with children playing down in the fields or so these pictures just depict you know life in Kabul which went on as as normal as possible you know people sent us when they received the prints they sent us pictures of oh, those prints hanging on their living room walls or on their desks and it it for them it meant a daily reminder of of what had been lost you know and uh, so for example we had this teacher in a school in the u.s who ordered a print um i think it was one of andra's pictures and it was a father with five of his kids on a bike and he was paying money to enter a park in kabul uh so yeah i mean and this teacher wrote to us saying i've ordered this print i want to thank you for organizing this and she taught at an all-girls school and she wanted her kids, her students there to have a visual reminder of how privileged their life was and how kids in other parts of the world, um, you know, didn't have those same um, access to, to just basic necessities of life. Could you tell us what were some of the reasons for the success of this uh, campaign? We could have gone the normal route and said donate to Afghanistan or something along those lines. But instead, uh, we wanted to ensure that we caught the attention of people across the world. And frankly, what better way to get noticed than through some beautiful pictures. Uh, we had access to some of the world's best images. It made sense to leverage our strength. Hence, a photo sale of photo print sale was a logical route to take for us. Uh, another reason, uh, you know, we, somewhere at the back of our minds, we also wanted to ensure that the Afghan story remained visible long after the dust had settled. A photo print sale ticked that box as well. Every time someone looked at one of the images that they purchased through the print sale, Afghanistan and its people would be seen. You know, it's it's on your walls, it's it's on your desk, and you know, every time you look at it, every time someone else who's at your house looks at it, and it it remains alive. The issue remains alive. Uh, thirdly, and most importantly, for the donors, this fundraiser went beyond being just a mere donation. They were active participants in the photo sale. They could choose which image they wanted to buy. They could interact with us through email, social media. They could, you know, if they wanted something specifically, they wanted to ask the photographer something, we were happy to facilitate that. It was very much a two-way street. Um, also, I think holding the print sale right while Afghanistan was still in the news, and also keeping the fundraiser open for a very limited time period meant that the urgency to act was that much stronger. Um, so all these factors, I think, played in, in making this campaign the success that it was. But I think finally, most importantly, it also took a community of world-renowned journalists, photographers, photo editors, and the media at large to engage, spread the word to a whole lot of other people and to get support towards this cause. It was every bit a team effort from the get-go. What are the things that organizations like similar organizations working on the ground, working at the grassroots level, what can they learn from this, from your experience or from this fundraiser? From the little that I have managed to get out of this project, a couple of things that stand out really clearly. One, define your 
pause and your immediate requirement very clearly. So for us, it was we specifically wanted to help women journalists in Afghanistan. And the access that we had to do that, the means that we had to do that was through this fundraiser. For an NGO in the education space, you could say, you know, June, for example, in in Bombay, in, in Mumbai, schools reopen. So maybe they can do like a back to school fundraiser, you know, so make it a very narrow focus thing and make sure that people know exactly where the funding is going to. So it's going to help. So if you're, you know, contributing rupees 100 towards a child's school supplies, um, make sure you put that out there in front that this is what it is going to help with. Um, the other thing that we did during the course of this fundraiser was also we the social media campaign that we ran through Instagram, we made sure that we constantly updated and kept in touch with our community, uh, you know, by letting them know that, um, yes, the prince will reach you six weeks down the line. Um, we kept putting out uh, pictures of, you know, of, of the milestones that we had reached during the campaign. Uh, we kind of kept them interested in little um, case studies that kept coming up during the fundraiser and way after that as well. Because all these, uh, you know, women in Afghanistan who needed help, uh, the, the emails that they sent out to us, the voice messages that they sent out to us, we made sure that we documented all of that. We kept, you know, clear records of what's going on. We made sure that we kept them updated with little nuggets of information all through. Yeah, I mean, today also it's the time uh, where, you know, you have large teams working on fundraisers and, you know, you have like these wonky websites that organizations have. But uh, this case has shown that you don't really need all of that, right? You can still run a successful campaign with a small team, with a basic website, basic functional website, and with a strong cause. Uh, could you Could you talk a bit about that? Journalists for Afghanistan was a very, you know, it's not an, it's not a formal NGO. It's not, you know, we didn't have any of those. It was, it was basically a, a, a fundraiser that happened overnight just for a limited time. So we already knew that we, you know, had no resources. We started from like literally zero funding. Um, so we put in the time and the effort ourselves to realize that all we needed was a place where we could display the prints, where people could go online and shop for prints. And then we needed a payment gateway to be attached to it. And then we needed one other end of it, which was where we could communicate with our community. So in terms of where we could, uh, you know, display these pictures and have them up there for people to buy them, we realized that, yeah, we could, you know, and we did go around looking for web designers and web developers. And we realized that, uh, one, nobody really was, you know, available at that short notice. Uh, if they were, they were charging us quite a sum of money, which we definitely didn't have. And uh, we realized that, you know, there has to be an easier way to get around this. And so... I literally sat there doing research overnight into how to build a website. And that's when I saw Wix up there. And there are a couple of other templates that you can use as well. So yeah, it was easy. There were a lot of technical bits that I had to familiarize myself with. Lots of YouTube videos that I watched. and But it's doable. So if I had to do it again, yes, there would be things that I might have done differently or, you know. So it's not, it's not very professional looking. But it served the purpose. Right. You know, all that people were coming on there for was to see the pictures displayed, to get information about, you know, shipping and uh, packaging and things like that. And at the back end, we needed to keep track of, you know, where these people were from, which geographies and uh, which photographers prints sold the most and, uh, you know, just to keep track of you know how much money was collected per day so things like that and Wix served the purpose beautifully we were surprised the first day that I went there and I looked at you know 
uh, oh my god so i know exactly who is bought a print and from <laughs> where and, you know it was like wow i mean i thought i'd have to you know really trudge the depths of the internet to find out right. what's going on so it it, it was just such a joy to realize that this was something that you know each of us could just do on our own right. didn't need any kind of you know reliance on softwares or or other people and expertise and years of like diploma courses or anything right. you know and um, so yeah the instagram account was again very easy to set up we set up an email address and it was just two of us who were doing this from ground up you know right. within a span of like 6 to 8 days Uh, a lot of campaigns that i see like uh, these days that 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 organizations run it is purely about like supporting for a cause uh, but from a donor's point of view from an individual donor's point of view there is nothing that they can sort of take home or there is nothing uh, that they that they in a way get in return right uh, you you want to kind of uh, talk about this part i feel that in a lot of cases just having that little tangible you know object sitting at your desk or on your walls or whether it's a cushion cover or a you know little handmade doll or a card or whatever i feel every time someone looks at that they are reminded that they managed to touch another life that they managed to do some good and i think that helps you to go out there and say i can do more of this I would encourage organizations to find innovative ways to connect their donor communities with their recipients. That that human connect is ultimately what will what what touches lives and will determine the outcome of a fundraiser more than anything else. Uh like based on your experience about running this campaign for women journalists in Afghanistan uh would you say that you know something like this is replicable and can other organizations replicate a similar campaign of this sort um similarly so i'm not sure replicate is something that would be because this was again tailored to a specific cause with a specific you know um set of criteria kind of thing um but yeah in terms of uh, can a similar idea be you know used to inspire other such fundraising uh, opportunities of course so it was a coming together of three four various different entities uh who were bound by a very similar cause you know who in each in its own way uh was directly or indirectly touched by uh, afghanistan and what was happening to its people and so i feel for every organization a similar kind of ecosystem does exist where you know their work overlaps with um what's happening in the world outside what is you know currently on their plate and how someone else out there might have the expertise the desire the willingness and the passion to help um so yeah is it replicable in that sense yes of course because um, so you might you know organization a might not be able to do a photo print sale but can definitely do you know another more um interesting exercise in let's say a cooking class or let's say you know they could do like a evening of dance or something else something that showcases possibilities and that plays to each person's strength and that can get you know the donor and the receiver together in the same space and uh, share experiences i think what you're suggesting is fundraising can be more personal it can be customized and that would sort of give organizations better results because uh, like anyway a lot of a lot of people are bombarded with you know those fundraising videos that you see as as ads uh, so i suppose what you're saying is the fundraising space needs to be more sort of customized it needs to be more meaningful for sure it needs to have it needs to have that connection between individuals right so, yeah. right
Oh, thanks so much, uh, Alifia, for all your insights. I suppose, uh, like next time an organization wants to run a fundraiser, uh, they should definitely get in touch with you. Can can they? Of course. I mean, anytime. <laughs> Please feel free. That sounds great. Uh, so thank you so much, Alifia, thanks for being so on this for podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It was lovely, you know, talking to you about all of this.